Connecticut's news station residents in Enfield sounding off at a town council meeting tonight. Why they say the town's new flag policy is really aimed at one specific flag, the pride flag. An arrest tonight in a Milford Street takeover where a cop was hurt. Police body cam video helped track down a suspect. The firefighters union in Southington saying they don't have enough firefighters. Why they say they can't do their job safely with current staff and what they asked the town council for tonight. Now at 10, this is Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. We begin tonight in Enfield, where dozens of supporters and allies of the LGBTQ community gathered in objection to a controversial flag policy. Thanks for joining us here at 10. I'm Brent Harden. And I'm Sarah Sanchez. That policy regulates what flags can fly on town property. Those who passed it say it's all encompassing and no one was targeted, but advocates disagree. Fox 61's Jake Garcia is live in Enfield now with more from both sides. Jake. Well, Brent and Sarah, the recent policy change is drawing criticism from members and supporters of the LGBTQ plus community, saying that this policy change is aimed at making the raising of the pride flag during Pride Month a thing of the past. Members and supporters of the LGBTQ plus community rallied outside of Enfield Town Hall prior to a town council meeting Monday night. It's a shame that this resolution is stemming from the pride flag hanging on town hall. Earlier this month, the town council passed a resolution saying only the American flag, the Connecticut state flag, and the MIA POW flag and flags representing the U.S. military branches can be flown or displayed on town buildings and property. We feel like this is an attack on the LGBT community. Um, and I say that only because we're the only ones that have flown a flag here on town hall. Newly elected mayor Kevin Nelson responding to the criticism of the policy. Well, the way they see it as targeting, I see it as it's an act, it's a discriminatory policy allowing one group and no other. How can you say that's not discrimination? And, you know, Enfield is all inclusive 100 percent. Lieutenant Governor Susan Bysowitz was in attendance at Monday's rally, emphasizing why these symbols matter. Those symbols are important because it says to people that you are uh, welcomed and accepted. After the rally, dozens of demonstrators attended the town council meeting to have their voices heard. The town has had zero protests or negative incidents at the ri rising of the pride flag over the previous two years. You had no reason to take an immediate action on resolution 6230. While others agreed with the new policy. The pride groups are asking for special privilege while they're also asking for equality. These two things go against each other. Protesters hope they can work with officials so they can continue to show their pride at Town Hall. And hopefully that we could come to some kind of terms or agreement where the flag can be displayed somehow. LGBTQ plus advocates say that they will continue to push back on the policy and they will continue their work to make this a more inclusive and welcoming community. Live in Enfield, Jake Garcia, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, Jake, thank you. Now, Enfield is not the only town that places restrictions on what flags can fly. Uh, in the past few years, communities across the state have struggled with the issue, leading to similar policies in Colchester, Darien, Easton, Goshen, and Litchfield, just to name a few. Some towns have named exceptions for fire departments. Uh, others are even more strict, blocking even POW MIA flags. For the full list of rulings uh, that put the infield decision into context, visit our website, fox61.com. We have explanations of individual town rules along with the background on the Supreme Court decision that spurred towns to act in the first place. All right, turning now to the weather, and uh, we had a brisk start to the week, but it's going to end very differently. Yeah, let's check in with Chief Meteorologist Rachel Frank for a first look at the forecast. Hi, Rachel. Yeah, big warm-up in the works. It's already not as cold out there tonight as it has been at any point during the weekend. And we'll finish the week with highs near 50 degrees. But first, before we turn warm, we've got to get through a bit of wintry weather. And that will be tomorrow, midday or afternoon as a start time, and continuing into Wednesday morning 
morning. This will be a light wintry mix of snow, rain, maybe briefly some ice as things are getting started. And heading into tomorrow night, we could transition over to a period of light patchy snow with some minor accumulations on the order of a coating up to an inch or so for most. And the result will be the chance for some slippery spots, especially untreated surfaces tomorrow for the evening commute and also for Wednesday morning. We're quiet outside right now. There's a couple flurries to the west of us, but we're watching some more numerous activity to the west, and this will really start to fill in as we head into the day tomorrow. Temperatures right now are in the 30s across the state. We're looking at overnight low temperatures that will drop back around 30 as we head towards daybreak. We began today in the single digits, so it's going to be a very big difference. It's a dry start for the morning commute midday into the afternoon. We see that light wintry mix or rain begin to develop. Temperatures are above freezing and then as temperatures drop, we'll watch for those slippery spots and a transition over to some light snow. Your full forecast coming up. All right, Rachel, thank you. New at 10, the Meriden man who has long been suspected of killing his ex-girlfriend will spend the next 30 years behind bars. John Watson was sentenced today for the murder of Perry Mason back in 2019. Investigators allege that Watson choked Mason to death during a fight about two days after they broke up. Police found Mason's charred remains at her place of work in Waterbury. Watson was eventually arrested in 2020 and charged with her murder. He pleaded guilty back in November. Police arrested teen accusing him of assaulting a police officer at a street takeover last year. A Milford police officer was responding to a large gathering in a stop and shop parking lot. Over 100 people were there when he arrived. He was immediately confronted by several of them. One male in a red puffer jacket threw a shopping cart at the officer and ran. You see that suspect here. The officer ran after him but was assaulted from behind and was injured. The male in the red jacket has been identified as a juvenile and was taken into custody today. Police say they're looking for other suspects and they're still investigating. A controversial ruling in the Elm City, a New Haven police officer that was charged in connection to the incident that left Randy Cox paralyzed is getting his job back. Oscar Diaz was the officer that slammed on the brakes, resulting in Cox going uh, uh, into flying, really, into a metal barrier. An arbitration board with the Connecticut Department of Labor has ruled to reverse the decision to terminate Diaz. Mayor Justin Elliker, along with New Haven's police chief, released a statement saying they disagree with the ruling and that they are filing a motion to vacate. Day seven of the Michelle Traconis trial takes us to Hartford, where police believe Fotis Dulos ended the night with his when his estranged wife, Jennifer Dulos, went missing. Yeah, Fotis, who died by suicide in January of 2020, is accused of killing Jennifer and then cleaning up the evidence. Traconis is accused of going along with uh, Fotis on that journey to get rid of it all. Fox 61's Julie LeBlanc has the latest. Camera angle by camera angle. A black truck or a black Ford Raptor. <clears throat> Investigators walking the jury through video evidence they collected from May 24th, 2019, the day Jennifer Dulos went missing. I noticed they uh, want to photos to what appeared to be a vehicle consistent with Mr. Dulos's vehicle. Connecticut State Police detectives tracked Fotis Dulos's location from his phone, pinpointing him along Albany Ave in Hartford that Friday night. After Jennifer went missing, they looked at cameras posted throughout the city, looking for cars associated with Fotis, tracking this Ford Raptor. Specifically, the trash getting dropped off in multiple City Hartford garbage cans. Police walking the jury through two separate videos from that night. The first near Albany Ave and Garden Street, where a man in a white shirt and a hat gets out of the car, dumps one garbage bag and another item next to the business. A witness testifying Monday that looked like a car mat. Investigators believe that's Fotis. Minutes later, he stops near Blue Hills Ave, this time with a woman in clear view in the passenger seat who reaches out of the car. A woman police say is Michelle Traconis, who later admitted it was her to investigators. Police believe Fotis got rid of something in the garbage bin and then. This particular instance, it looked like a, a sewer um, and well, something was placed in it. That's something police say was altered license plates with a canceled registration to an old Chevy Suburban owned by Fotis. This character is actually a one 
Um, the same here, this was needed to be a B, but it's actually a D. The defense making several objections during the testimony. He exited his vehicle with what appeared to be maybe a pile of papers or something. Again, kind of Your fact. Honor, I'm, I don't know what it was. I'm objecting. Also happening today, another close call with a juror who went to the clerk saying they recognized a name on the state's witness list. After talking with the judge and being interviewed by him, he said that he grew up with that witness but never really spoke to him. So the judge is letting that juror remain seated in this trial. We are in Stamford, Julia LeBlanc, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. Hi, Julia, thank you. The future of Southington's fire department taking center stage at a town council meeting tonight. The union representing the firefighters says it's been over two and a half years since they've seen a contract and the holdup has been overstaffing. Union leaders say the town is not requiring a safe number of people to man the trucks. They're requiring three at minimum and the town only requires two when someone is on leave. Firefighters argue that one person can mean the difference between putting a fire out and serious tragedy. What job, you tell us tonight, what job don't you want us to do? Water supply, rescue, your kids, your pets. We're only limited so much. It's up to you guys. If you want us to save people, property, increase staffing. Now, the union says they're not pushing for more hires despite these staffing shortages. They're just pushing for the town to maintain all budgeted positions. It's not clear if or when they will return to the bargaining table. Tonight's gathering was meant to show support for the firefighters.